Hello, hello. Let me try this WhatsApp quick. Why? Because <clears throat> you have to. What, do you have something else scheduled? Yo, rest of the class really needs to work on, on scheduling. Okay, RISPL 2020, let me just start marking up the register. Hmm. Okay, good. Um, what are you talking about? You're not being mocked. Do you have something scheduled there? Why would you leave after 30 minutes? <laughs> and uh, yeah, like, welcome back, you two, because, yeah, I do see on the register. Jean-Marc, you also missed the last three, right? Or wait, did you just arrive at last, last week's one late? I forget. Um, and Bryn will be back again now as well. I think he was hunting last week. So it's good that he's back too. And my father, like I said, when did you say? I couldn't make it because of work. Oh, okay. What work are you doing? Like a part-time job? Scroll up. Yes. Oh, okay. I see. All right. I, I missed that one line. I mean, that was a lot of messages. Um, cool, I see. Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Well, um, mostly. Uh, okay. Cool, and yeah, Bryn's here, already marked. Hello, hello, welcome back. How was your hunting trip? No school work had like three Afrikaans assignments and they just keep adding assignments. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you guys were pretty hectically overworked. But I mean, school's, school's off for most of you now, right? This week at least. And next week, I think. It was good. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay. Let me just get to the right part of my textbook quick. We have online schooling in three weeks. Well, I mean, school, wait, so you're saying including Saturday and Sunday? When you say every single day, or do you mean like every single day, like a normal school week? If they're doing it on weekends, that's quite hectic. But I guess three weeks is quite a long break as well, hey? Huh? Okay, yeah, attendance is getting better. 
prob five days. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, if it's a normal school week, that makes sense. I mean, they, you guys have to go back to school at some point, right? <laughs> Can't just be on holiday forever. Um, all right, let me... Okay, I'll mark the rest. Don't remind me. Yeah, I, I can imagine you getting just getting used to a weekend and then having to go back to school. That would be horrible. Or long holiday, rather. Um, okay, let me make sure that everything's set up before I share. Cool. I'm going to share my screen. We're just going to get right into things. Uh, you guys will have to, like, join the... Mm. Ah, okay, another person just joined as well. That's cool. Ah, cool. It's Tari and Tariq joined. Awesome. Okay, cool. I, I think I'll share the screen now. Some other people might be a little bit late, but, you know, we can't wait forever. So I've shared my screen. Hopefully you guys can see it. Um, if you go to www.menti.com and use the code 830080, okay? You don't need to put the spaces, by the way. You can go on your cell phone, in another tab on your computer, anywhere you like. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't so much matter. It's going to ask you for a nickname. Feel free to make your nickname anonymous or just use the one that they recommend to you um, because there is like a bit of a leaderboard thing. But remember, it's just for fun. Um, and yeah, but, but yeah, feel free to use an anonymous nickname or use your whatever one you like. You can do whatever you like. Obviously, yeah. Okay, I see one person's joined. I'll wait for you guys to join. So yeah, the code is 8380080. I guess I'll put it in the chat as well, just in case it's uh, www.menti.com. You can see it on my on my shared screen there, Tari. Um, so yeah, www, uh, like at the top of the thing. And the code is 8300080. Um, And yeah, you guys don't have to create an account or anything. You just you just visit the site. It'll ask for the code. You put that code in, and and it's pretty self-explanatory from there, really. I'm in. Cool, cool. Uh, didn't you you won last week, Creflo? I think you nudged up Taddy by like uh, fifty points or something, right? That was a exciting one. Um, so guys, for those of you who are wondering, it's not like a difficult quiz or anything. It's not important either. It's just to get us, um, you know, thinking, thinking along the correct lines and, um, you know, wake us up basically. Well, it's like, uh, you'll see now, Dappe, you'll see now. Um, it's like a, yeah, it's like an interactive quiz. So there's only five questions. The faster you answer, the better. It tests what you just read. Actually, you know, Dappe, you're probably in a pretty good good spot since if you just read um, page 66 to 70, um, then you might be in a pretty pretty competitive spot here. Uh, Bryn as well, because I think Bryn was or at least consulted it a little bit. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll wait for a little while and then get started. So four of you have joined so far. I think I should expect about seven, um, but obviously we won't wait forever because we do have to get started. And by the way, you can join mid-quiz, mid by the way. So even if we do start, you'll be late, like you might miss a question or two, um, but you can technically join at any time um, and it will just throw you into whatever question we're on. Okay, so I will give you guys a little bit of extra time. I don't know if, because it is the first that some of you will be seeing this. But remember, it is just for fun, so don't feel pressured. It is like quite a cool, cool site, actually. Um, and the quizzes are quite fun. So yeah, I'll give you guys one more minute. So you go to www.menti.com. You can go on any device. I say go on a different device from the one you're watching and type in the code 830080. If not, then we'll just start with the four people who have joined. I'll give like another minute or so. Do, 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 do. Although I guess, yeah, some people might be a little bit um, hesitant if they missed last week's lecture, I suppose. Okay, but then also I imagine after they see that it's fun, maybe they'll be more enthusiastic about joining. All right, let's get started. 
and yeah for those even even if you're not in the quiz if you if you weren't if you were um too freaked out to join then just do still watch because the questions are relevant to what we covered last week yeah exactly yeah good luck have fun huh okay so first question at which stage of the application life cycle would we create a unified modeling language diagram specifying the layout of the program so at which stage of the application life cycle would we create a uml diagram hmm so i mean i guess we can think about like at which stage would we specify the layout of the program three Ah, interesting. Okay, interesting. Hectic, hectic. Okay, I, I know. So, so one of the classes did struggle on this question and another one was okay. Um, but yeah, I guess one person got it. I take from the hee hee that it was Creflo. Um, so yeah, guys, the, the hint here, like even if you had never heard of UML before, right? Hypothetically, maybe oh, I spelled language wrong. Okay, jokes on me, I guess. Because um, I say language, G-A-U. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, the point is, even if you have never heard of UML before, the fact that it's saying specifying the layout of the program, so it specifies the layout. Um, if we're thinking about layouts, we're definitely thinking about the design stage, right? Because we're not actually programming anything. Okay, we're making a diagram, it's, it's design. Architecture, perhaps. Okay, oh, oh, come on, why does it do this? Okay, sorry about that, guys. We're going to, the, the first question is null and void now, unfortunately. I, I needed to reset all the slides. Uh, that's so annoying. Okay, cool, there's five people now though, so that's good to see. All right, um, sorry about that, but we're now checking. Are you guys, were you guys concentrating? <laughs> Um, so yeah, same question. Sorry about that. It is a bit of a, uh, I hadn't reset it from the previous time I gave people this quiz. Easy dubs. Exactly. Exactly. Yo, someone still answered development. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, on to the next question. Right. At what phase of the application lifecycle do we monitor and manage the deployed application? At what phase of the application lifecycle? If, if some of you had like a quick reaction time or quick reading, you would have seen the solution for, to this one as well. Um, but we'll see. Not everyone got it right though, Krefno. Still one person answered development, did you see? <laughs> Respect, yeah. I mean, so one extra person did join because we started with four and now there are five, so. Uh, so guys, you can join the quiz at any time here. You can go to www.minty.com and the code is at the top of the screen there. 830080. Easy points though, so can't blame us. Yeah. No, fair enough. Um, no honor. <laughs> I've been thinking with this question, I got it wrong. Oh, okay. Um, someone didn't answer, it looks like. Okay, so two people answers maintenance, someone answered development, interesting, and someone answered regression testing. Okay, so regression testing is an interesting answer here. It's almost justified. So manage, monitoring, managing, testing the deployed application, in, in particular testing the deployed application, we do call that regression testing. Um, but remember the question asks at what phase of the application lifecycle it's not asking at what level of testing do we test 
the deployed application. It's asking at what phase of the application life cycle. So it's asking about a phase. So regression testing is not a phase of the application life cycle. It's a level of testing in the testing phase, right? Um, so development, development is when we actually create the application. We're not just monitoring and managing it, right? And obviously when we're creating the application, it wouldn't always necessarily be in deployment. Um, so yeah, so those of you who said maintenance, uh, well done, that, that's correct. Okay. When we combine units of code together and test the interfaces between them, we call it mm testing. What do we call it? Damn, Dappe, that is quite hectic. Oh, I see uh, Ada, you joined now. Um, if you if you want to join the quiz, you can go to www.menti.com and type the code 830080. Uh, you missed the first few questions, but you can still you can still join. Probably got this one wrong. Okay. I mean, I would say that there are like two. Let's see what people. Yo, okay, interesting. Yeesh. Um, huh, so one person again. Okay, so we'll have to go through this one a little bit. Um, I, I think, yeah, so some people went here last week as well. Okay, so regression testing, we just discussed what regression testing was. Acceptance testing, um, Dappe gave us a pretty good, oh, well, well done, Bryn. I suppose you did just read the testing section before this, right? Or, or maybe I, the name does kind of make sense when we discuss it a little bit as well. So, oh, okay, cool. So acceptance testing is when we give it to users and the business owner and we ask them if they like the application, but no one said that, so that's cool. Unit testing. So some of you might have been fooled or one of you might have been fooled that we say units in the top here, right? But unit testing is testing a single unit of code, right? Um, it is 830080. You can see it at the top of my screen currently if you look at my shared screen. It's at the top there. Um, you don't need to put the spaces. But it's also upwards in the chat, if you scroll up. Um, so unit testing is testing the individual units of code. It's not testing um, the interfaces between them. Okay, so system testing, interesting answer. Um, so system testing is when we test the entire final application. Okay, we test like it's, like it's finished now or whatever change we were making, we're finished now and we're testing the entire application together. So it's all of the units of code, everything together. Integration testing is just when we go, look, we have a unit of code that deposits money into a bank account, for example. We have a unit of code that withdraws money from a bank account. We're now just gonna combine these units together and just make sure that they work as we expect together. Make sure that they can communicate properly and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, integration testing is correct here. But it's, you see, it's good that we do this quiz to remind you guys of stuff like this. Okay. So next question. What do we call a program to desi designed to assist in achieving a specific task? What do we call a program designed to assist in achieving a specific task? Weird question. I, I just included this one because it even caught me out, actually. I see a sixth person has joined, but that's cool. Some more people are joining. Um, yeah. Again, you would have missed some of the questions, but yeah, if you join next week on time, then then you can, you know, it can be a more friendly competition. But now other students have a head start. Oh, seven people have joined. Interesting. Okay, guys, don't worry about getting this one wrong. When the first time I saw this definition, I also thought algorithm. I also thought algorithm the first time I saw this definition. So what needs to give it away is that this is a... Um, this section is called the application life cycle. And so particularly in the context of section two, I mean, section three, ah, oh, well done, well done. Particularly in the context of section three, when you see that design, that, that definition, you must think about, um, well, you also just read, so 
I'm still going to get the <laughs> Don't be defeatist. Okay, so look. Anyway, um, when I saw this as well, I also thought algorithm. Um, it's a very weird definition for the word application. I agree with you. Um, but, but yeah, I, the reason I included this is just to tell you or just to show you that the MTA sometimes does define application this way. I know it's weird, um, but again, I don't, I don't write the textbook. Okay, I think this is the last question actually. Um, which level of testing contains alpha and beta testing? Which level of testing contains alpha and beta testing? This I thought was a nice question. Because um, it shows if you can connect the ideas in your head. I suppose it also requires you to know what alpha and beta testing are, but we did discuss them a little bit last week. Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, so again, answering system. That's cool. Someone answered integration. Interesting. You see, um, yeah, I, so let's think about what that one person was hard thinking. <laughs> um, let's think about what, what alpha and beta testing is doing, right? So when we do alpha and beta testing, we take the product, the system, to our users. Ideally, it would already be working somewhat, right? It's like close to being a final product. And we take it to the users and we say, we let them use it and just tell them to give us feedback. We track whatever bugs they're experiencing. Um, and you know, they give us feedback. And, and so that is acceptance testing because we're taking it to the users, right? And um, we're actually going to the people who are going to be using the product and, and we allow them to, to play with it. Okay. So, Regression testing, this is actually, this is actually an interesting answer. Um, remember that regression testing doesn't explicitly include the users, um, but this, this I'd say is pretty fair. Integration testing, um, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't really justify this one actually. I think, so yeah, integration testing is when we combine units of code and we test the interfaces between them, okay. System testing, testing the final product, you know what, fair enough, but acceptance testing is definitely more correct than system testing. Um, acceptance testing is definitely like more correct because it explicitly involves going to the users, giving them access and getting their feedback, right? System testing doesn't really include any explicit idea of user feedback and feedback from business owners, et cetera. Um, this is just testing the final product before, before we deploy and go into production. Okay. All right, yeah, yeah, interesting, guys. Um, let's see. I'm most likely came first. Good stuff. Um, I assume, so yeah, these were the four who were in it from the beginning, right? Yo, Tadi, again, you were pipped by like, what? 25 points. That's two seconds in a row. Hectic, 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 hectic. Um, at least, I mean, you guys are in like a close battle here. Um, it's like a Lewis Hamilton and Bottas. <laughs> okay, um, so I think we, that's cool, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fun thing, I think. And, and next, so you missed last week's lecture, you missed last, week le last week's lecture, friend. Um, so it's, this one would have been a particular challenge for you. But obviously next week, the test will be on things that we learned this week. So you'll probably be at a, at a better spot. Okay, so with that all done, I think we must immediately get in because that did take 20 minutes, a bit longer than maybe we should spend.
Um, so I'm just reminding you, so this is what the application lifecycle looks like, all right? We, we did cover this last week, but what we didn't do is go over the little example that I wanted us to do. Um, so this will be quite fun, but we do have to do it quick, okay? Because I do want to start on the next part, because uh, obviously we have missed quite a few lectures um, at risk fault, so we must, you know, uh, pick up the pace a little bit, but I still want to do the example because it is fun and the other schools have contributed, so we should, we should do it. Okay, so you can visit that URL. I'm going to open it up over here. And this, this is what the page, it's the UG it's a, is today when we add onto the Rickroll website. Exactly. Well, at least for the first little bit of today. We're going to do this very quick, and then we're going to move on with the next part of section three, because it is, it is quite important. Okay, so this is the website that we've created. Okay, so Brianston contributed it. Brianston's contribution was this awful green background the lime green background, that was Brianston's contribution. Crawford decided that we should add this free V-Bucks button. Um, so you can click the free V-Bucks button and get some free V-Bucks. But um, yeah, we, we are gonna contribute our own thing. We're gonna go through the application lifecycle together and sort of see how it is that it might work in the real world. Obviously, a bit of a simplification that you guys will at least be able to see these ideas in action. Okay, so first things first. Uh, github.com. You guys probably haven't heard of this before, but if you visit that URL, what you'll see is this. Okay, so this is called GitHub. It tracks changes that are made to code. Um, so this is all the code defining our website. And you can see a lot of, a lot of different information about it. I don't know if it can give you a line count. Um, I don't know. But it might be interesting, but you can see there are a lot of files here. There's, there's a lot going on with, with the website. Um, but you can actually see all of the code changes we've ever made. So we added the free V-Bucks button. We added back, we changed the background to lime green on July 1st. Um, and you can see everything that's gone on in the creation of this website, okay? Quite a simple, quite an ugly website, but you can see all the code and all the changes that we make are tracked on there. The other thing I want to show you is what's hosting the application. So this application is hosted through something called Heroku, Heroku, um, which is like there are lots of other places you could host. Google Firebase is very popular nowadays. Um, AWS, right, Amazon Web Services, they host about 70% of the world's websites. Um, so that's definitely a popular solution as well. But we are using something called Heroku. And you can see a little, we've got a little pipeline going on here. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more later. First things first, if we go to the GitHub page, click on projects and go over into this, you'll see we have a little bit of a dashboard here. Okay, so this, uh, you see the dashboard is called BFMTA requirements. And it says that we're gonna be performing requirements analysis here. I'm not sure if you guys will be able to see the project necessarily, but if not, you can definitely look at it on my on my screen. So you can see we've got our Rickroll button and our green background there in the done tab of our, uh, of our requirements dashboard. We've got nothing in progress currently. The site is not currently being worked on and we've got a bunch of things to do. And you guys can add to the li this list as well. This is just ideas that have already come up. Okay, um, so let's just go through them. If you guys like a particular idea, then, then we can think about implementing it, um, but otherwise, yeah, otherwise we can create our own one. So someone suggested that we add audio to the website. An interesting idea, but might get us into some kind of copyright um, trouble. Okay, but what I want you to remember is in, in the slides, when we performed requirements analysis, um, the product owner, the faceless person in a suit, would give us some vague idea, right? They would go, we want to be able to upload videos, or your friends must be able to view them, or go on mobile devices, right? Access the website on mobile devices. And we take these broad categories and make them specific. So that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna perform requirements analysis together. Um, so you guys are the business owner. I am the, pro the developer in this case. Um, we might switch roles eventually, but, but not today. Okay, so we can add audio to the site. We can make the font blue. We could add a gift to the website. We could make like some kind of artsy banner thing, or we could add a logo, some kind of logo. Okay. Um, 
if you guys have any other ideas, you can post them in the chat and we can add them to this list of requirements um, if you like. Does, does anyone have something that they would like to see on the site? Um, so yeah, feel free to, you can say through your mic as well. Hey, feel free to speak through the mic. It's also quicker, I think. But if you wanna type them out as well, if not, then maybe I can, op should I open up a poll perhaps? Can I open up a poll? Yeah. Oh, jeez. Why does it? You have to actually log into thing to, surely not. Poll, poll. Google has a dino game. Oh, okay. Well, Bryn, we can't spend the whole the whole week creating this website. Okay, um, we do have to we have to finish it eventually. So I'll um, I, I we we can't make a dino game right now because that would take very long. Uh, no, no, don't don't apologize. I I mean that that is you can we can put this. It it is quite illustrative actually putting that kind of example because you would just throw that here. Be like some kind of dino game, some kind of game, right? So I can add that to the list of things to do. Um, and yeah, it's, it's on the list, but obviously this is very technical. This is quite a difficult thing to create. Um, and so we would have to, you know, we would have to expand on that. That would be what requirements analysis is, right? Um, so vote, I'll say, what change should we make? I'll say it's going to be single choice and what changes do we have? I'll, I say GIF, um, GIF uh, logo and font. Let's, let's make those our three options because those seem like good ones and that are achievable quickly. So GIF, logo, fonts, um, save. So how, does, how do polls work in this? Launch polling. Vote in progress. Okay, so there are nine attendees currently. And yeah, you guys can just go ahead and vote. I think, um, yeah. Okay, I, I did expect GIF to win out, but, but we can think about, but yeah, logo, logo is quite cool as well, I think. Logos are important for websites as well. Um, our, what would our logo be? Something to do with free V-Bucks. <laughs> no idea where to vote. I, I, I'm not sure how the other people have done it. Where, where did we do? A V-Buck icon. Actually, not bad. Adding a V-Buck icon would be important. I'll add that to the... Free V-Buck. What was that, Ada? Did you... Was that a recommendation? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear. Oh, okay, cool. Um, all right. It seems like GIF is winning out. There are technically three more votes. So if all three of the remaining people voted logo, they could, they could technically say. But I think if, if GIF gets one more vote or if font gets a vote, I say we do something original. Original. Um, being original is pretty maybe unrelated to Fortnite. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. We can add whatever GIF we want though, hey? Um, okay, I think shall we go with GIF and let's just pick a GIF. Um, we can pick like an interesting GIF. Logo could be a picture of a bee buck and then underneath that isn't a scan. There's a GIF of the whole Shrek movie. Really? Um, yeah, okay, so finding GIFs. Okay, so we can say what GIFs. Can, you can download GIFs like easily like this. Yeah, you can. Awesome. Um, I like Homer Simpson. But I think a GIF, Shrek, Shrek GIF, Shrek, Shrek. These are not GIFs. Okay, this is a GIF. This is a GIF. Um, no, it matches the background as well because Shrek is green and the website's, the, the website's background is green, right? So it kind of makes sense. 
<laughs> you're going. Shame that bear. If you want to recommend another GIF, we can add it. We can add it. Um, wow, Shrek dabbing. Okay. Um, I like this one. We'll do this one. We, we do need to finish this as well. So let's go for this one. I'm going to go ahead and save this inside the where I have all the website code. So it's under, so it's on my computer. Okay, BFMTA. Ooh, where should I put it? Okay, we'll, we'll move it around just now. I'm just going to save it here for now. Okay, and we'll call this Shrek.gif. They are, I mean, that, that's kind of the, what the internet is for though, right? Weird GIFs. Nowadays, especially with TikTok being so popular, seems like basically the entire purpose of the internet is weird GIFs or weird WebMs. Anyway, okay, cool. So we've done requirements analysis. We're, we're going for a GIF. Well, we've started requirements analysis. So we need to be slightly more technical, right? We need to we need to be slightly more technical. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click convert to issue and I'm going to type um, sort of what we need to do. We're also going to put design here. Okay, so add a GIF. Um, I'll say it should be above the button, right? We need to be very technical here. Above the button using HTML image tag. Okay, so that's how you would perform requirements analysis, right? You would go like, someone would add or even we can be more specific than this add the gif we downloaded right so someone will give you this broad thing of okay add a gif to a website and you have to take that broad categorization and make it specific describe how we're going to do it okay the next phase what is the next step guys what is the next phase of the application life cycle can anyone tell me let me also just take off my jacket while design exactly <laughs> So now we need to perform some kind of planning, right? So how are we going to do this? I've already started planning in a way by saying that I'm going to be using the HTML image tag. Okay, the HTML image tag. What I want you guys to also see in this example is that it's messier in the real world, right? In, on, on the application lifecycle in the slides, we have this really neat, um, we have this really neat sort of circular graph, right? But obviously in the real world, things aren't this neat. There are gray areas. There are things that are both requirements and design and design and developments and testing and developments. It's like all overlaps with each other, but we like to think about it in this neat cyclical way. Okay, sort of like the life cycle in biology as well. Like obviously it's more complicated than just a nice little neat diagram, right? Um, so we now need to perform planning. So design, um, so we, Basically, how you would do this is research. So I would say like HTML add GIF, um, something like that. And we can, we can open up this. And it literally is, this is, how, this is how you would go about this. No one remembers every single specific tag. Um, this, this looks good. So we would use this. So I'm going to take this code over here and say, how we will add this to the website will look something like this. So I'm just planning, doing some research, making sure that I know what, what I'm trying to approach. Okay, so that would be the design stage. Okay, I then click convert to issue. And you can see now this is like an in progress task. You see it's GIF. And so I'm just going to move that across and say, so that if, if other people were working on the project simultaneously, so that they know that, that this someone is currently working on this. GitHub also has another nice feature where you can assign yourself. So you can look currently in the bottom right, bottom right of this tag. I'll click assign myself and you can see my picture will appear there. See, so now everyone will know when they access this that I'm presently working on this. And now we have finished the design stage and we would enter into the development stage. Okay, so how would I do that? Well, you can see all of the code is available here, right? Um, at the link I sent you. Okay, I have that code stored locally on my computer as well. Okay, this code here is stored in the cloud, but I have it here on my computer as well. You can see there's our little GIF of Shrek. Um, might be actually a little bit complicated to do this, but we will we, we'll, we'll adjust. Okay, 
Um, so I am going to add a, how should I do that? Because it's going to be very difficult to access this file. Um, actually, okay, that's the correct way of doing this. We need to go ahead and find that Shrek GIF again. I'm actually going to reference it on the server so that we don't have to set up um, static file hosting. But you guys will see that it is always a little, okay, cool. So let me just say copy link address. There we go. Okay, so I just fetched the URL of the GIF that I'm putting on the site and we could change the URL very easily. So if anyone's particularly upset about the GIF that we have, we'll very quickly be able to alter it. You saw a naked Shrek. Yeah, the internet is dangerous, Creflo. The internet is dangerous. Okay. Ooh, that's not a very neat URL. That's why I didn't I didn't want to um, be searching for gifts too much on my um, with my screen shared because you you never know what things come up in Google search results. Copy image address. Can I copy the image address? Okay, exactly. That's what we need. All right. Um, so we've keep it PG in the chat, please. PG in the chat. Okay. So we've got the, um, we've got the gift that we want and I'll put it over here and we're all good. Okay, so that's the gift that we're gonna be adding. All right, so I go into the code, this is the code, all right? This is the code for the homepage. Um, this, is, this is what the homepage looks like. We will discuss what all of this means in a little while, but for now, I'll just show you this. So this first line here where we say style equals background color lime green. Again, we, we discussed this in a lot more detail in chapter four, which is focused on web development, but obviously background color lime green, that's what's making the background color green, okay? We've got this line here, button, on click, window.location, href, and we're linking to this. Not, don't have to be super technical about it. It's a button. This is the free VBuck button. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the GIF here, okay? So how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna open up an image tag, an HTML image tag. It'll look something like that. And actually I'll just copy paste it so that I don't do a typo. It is very simple. The, the code that might be slightly more complicated than you expect is the um, code for serving the website, okay? Why can't C sharp? Ooh, believe me, um, C sharp code is much simpler than what the modern internet is programmed in. Um, we'll learn about JavaScript in chapter four, and trust me, JavaScript is the most horrible language you could ever, ever see. Um, it is like very crazy and unneat. Um, okay, so that might work. I, I think. Yeah, it's 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 right it's right yeah. can you hear me? No. That. I, I can hear, I can hear. You said you can No. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's all good. Okay, so you see, there's the Shrek GIF. But now notice, guys. So again, this is the most awful looking website in the whole world, right? But now notice guys, when you visit the website um, at bfmta.herokuapp.com, exactly, the website has not changed at all, right? Oh yeah, yeah, oh, oh, so yeah, so you're saying the website is not, I don't know what sus is, but it's not good looking if that's what you're saying. Yeah, it's a horrible website, but the point is it's we're, we're altering it, okay? So we've got a Shrek GIF. You guys can see that I have the Shrek GIF here. This looks a lot like a web, suspicious. It is very suspicious. I, I did want to get to this. You see, I started, the first time we did this example was the 3rd of July, and I do need to pull this website down, or then I'm gonna get reported or something. <laughs> okay, so we've got a Shrek GIF, okay? You can see I've got it here, right? It's stored locally, but you can see that the website itself has not updated. Right, the website still looks like this, but the code looks like this for me. So what's going on here? Well, I have ch made changes. I have altered the code locally. So I've changed it on my own development branch, but I haven't yet told Heroku to update the site that everyone is seeing. So what we're gonna do now is go ahead and push this code. 
So I'll, I'll show you what that means. Again, don't have trouble. Remember that we are going through the stages of the, um, the, the life cycle here. So we've just finished developments or we're, we're doing developments. Okay, so I have made some changes to my code locally on my own machine, right? All the code is here. And I now need to tell the development server that I have made these changes. So if I type get status, you guys can see that it's highlighted this thing in red and it says it's modified. So I have modified this page, okay? It's telling me that I've changed some code and you guys saw me change it, right? I added the image tag, I added this line of code, okay? So what I'm gonna do is say git add dot. So I'm saying like, you can see now if I type git status, that modified will now be in green. So it's saying like, okay, I'm looking at this and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna make these changes now, okay? What you do, it's quite cool. So in, in, in GitHub, if you, you, you will be able to see these. So I'm going to, I'll send them to you now. Um, that command prompt looks like you're about to hack the CIA. <laughs> hardly, hardly. Um, so cool, I'll, I'm gonna send this to you guys now. So if you visit that URL, I think it is publicly available. You'll be able to see all of the previous changes I've made to the code. So for example, when changing the background to lime green, you could click that and it tells you exactly what changes I made to the code for that commit. When adding the button, you can click that commit, the last commit that was made, and you can see I added this line to the code, okay? What I'm about to do is commit this change we just made. So I'm gonna say added Shrek GIF. So what I'll say is I'll go git commit, and remember, we will talk about this more in chapter four under web development. Um, but for now, this is just to get an idea of the application lifecycle. So this is in development. I've made some changes and I'm pushing my changes. I'm finalizing my changes. So I say git commit dash M added Shrek GIF. Okay, cool. So I've, I've put a comment there to explain to other programmers what it is I did. Okay, I hit enter. Okay. So it's, it's ready now. So now when I say get status, it's gonna say, um, yeah, I, the, the changes are committed. But the notice that I, I'll go to GitHub, you can see it's still not updated. I now need to push these changes to the internet. And I do that by just typing git push. And you also have to say origin master. So that's just saying from where to where. Okay, so, ooh, sorry. Uh, oh, right, sorry, I'll just say git push. Uh, why is this why is this doing this? Fatal origin does not appear to be a git repository. What is it saying? Oh, am I not inside the I am. This is a bit weird. Git push. Did I spell origin incorrectly? That's possible. Oh, I spelled origin incorrectly. Sorry. That's just me being silly and feeling the pressure of while of programming while people are watching. Okay, um, anyway, live demonstrations, they always go a little bit wrong. Okay, I've pushed these changes, we have to be quick now. Okay, so now when I refresh the link that I just sent you, you can see it says added Shrek if, and it tracks, tracks the exact changes I made to the code. I'll now jump over here. Look, so Heroku has detected that something has changed. Um, Heroku will detect that something has changed and it is building the application. So it's now deploying the changes. So you can actually watch it. It's actually gonna do everything now. It's installing all the requirements. There's a whole bunch of steps. It's actually like a pretty annoying, a pretty annoying process, um, setting it all up. But what this was doing is automatically seeing that I made a change to the code and deploying the application. It says launched. Okay, so now the application has been launched, right? You might think like, wait, haven't we skipped something? There's, there's an application lifecycle. So what I'm gonna do is go over to this BFMTA Heroku app.com. You just watched it launch. You've watched me push the changes to the, to the console. So I push enter. It hasn't changed, right guys? You guys can check it as well. I'll copy the link here. It hasn't changed. So what's going on? See that it hasn't changed. Well, um, what, ha what comes after development guys in the, in the application lifecycle? What comes after development? Feel free to say through your mic since it is faster. Is it maintenance? What comes after the development phase? 
finalization. Ooh, come on, guys. It's, it's in your textbook as well. Is that a thing? Um, in a way, but that would... Testing. Yes. Okay. We have to test the application. We just made some changes. I looked at them locally, but do they work on the internet? We need to check that they, that they work on the internet. Okay. So how, how do we do that? Well, you see that I have deployed the changes, but they haven't been pushed to the final site yet. So what do we do? There is another link. Okay. There is another place to look. And I'll, I'll show you that. So you see, I've got bfmta.herokuapp.com. That's the final website, right? The, the website that we'll send to our users. But there's a safe way to test things. Okay. If you visit this link, bfmta-staging.herokuapp.com, then you will see our website with the Shrek GIF. So there I can look. I can make sure that the changes I made are working correctly, and we can see that they are. Okay, so this is testing. Obviously, we would do more complicated testing on a more complicated site, um, but we've got a staging application here to visualize and view all of the changes that we have made before we show them to our users. Okay, so if we're all happy that this is working, that the, that the change is working correctly, that everything is going smoothly, then what we do as the final step, we push, we go to the pipeline, and I say, promote to production, okay? And it's saying, okay, we're gonna go from the staging application to the real world application and click promote. And you see it says released version eight. So this is version eight of the website. And I'll go and visit bfmta.herokuapp.com. And there we go. We now have a Shrek GIF, okay, now, for like maintenance, what we would do, we would go back to our pipeline. I mean, our little development, our development requirements thing. And we look here and we say, look, I've added a gift to the website. So I move that across. I mark this job as finished. Okay. And we just, and we just continue to monitor the application. So in this case, what monitoring I've set up, if this application, if this website bfmta.herokuapp.com. If it's down for more than five minutes, I'll be emailed. Okay, so we do that kind of maintenance. And that would be taking a single change to the website through the entire application lifecycle. Okay, and notice that we would do that for every single one of these changes. Every little change we make, we would go through the whole application lifecycle. Okay, it's like a continual process. Anyway, so yeah, I just wanted to show you that to show you like how this might work in the real world. Obviously, there are a lot of different ways to manage the application lifecycle and every company does it in there in like a slightly different, unique way. Um, but that's, that is one way to do it. Okay, so that brings us to the end of that first little bit of section three. The next part will be data structures. However, before we start with data structures, we should probably take a break. Um, so Let's do a, I don't want to do too long of a break um, because we, we do need to get started. Can we come back at 15.55, please? 15.55, because I do want to get started on data structures um, because we mustn't, mustn't be satisfied with being behind, okay? Because I actually also really like the song. Um, it is very catchy. The music video is a little weird though. Okay, so I'll be back at 15.55. Uh, let me just close all this. I do want to go and get a glass of water. Um, okay, actually I think the GIF, the GIF was a good contribution. It adds, it adds, makes the site much more lively, I think. Um, but you never, we will continue editing the site because chapter four is all about web development. Um, and it might, you never know, it might look pretty good by the end, actually. It's going to be a really official Rickroll website. I think the Shrek GIF kind of makes it too obvious that you're not going to be given free V-Bucks, but I don't know. Okay, going to go grab some water.
that was quick. Okay, yeah, we're on break till 15.55, so you guys can sort of chill till then. Uh, we are recording, right? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, no, this is quite good, actually. Yeah. yeah. Attendance is up. Oh, by the way, guys, like, just in case any of you are still here, um, just during the break, uh, did, did you guys manage on the initiation challenge? We will discuss it before the end of the lecture, but when are we going to start with Code Wars? I'm, so, um, Creflo, I'll recommend a cutter every single week, this week included. There will be a, a recommended cutter every single week. Some of them are very difficult though. So I've got like, for the next three weeks, I've got cutters that are pretty okay. Um, but they are, like they do get very hard actually. So I had a coding interview yesterday and I was preparing by doing some cutters in Python. And yeah, like around 5Q, they get quite difficult. So if, I mean, if we can get you guys to like 6Q and C sharp by the end of the, um, by the end of the course, that would be that would be pretty cool. Uh, yeah, it's just for like a little intent. I can send you their website. So I was interviewing for like an internship with this company. They're just doing some. So they have like a monitoring system, like for patient, like for oxygen levels in your blood and stuff. And they want to partner with the Eastern Cape Health Department to do something for COVID and stuff, like something for coronavirus. Honestly, I think it might be maybe a bit too late. Don't tell them I said that. But we, but yeah, they just need some help. And yeah, so that's what the internship's about. But I mean, it's just work experience, right? Getting work experience is important want to become a developer or something which I'm not sure I do but you know they they are challenging I mean definitely don't be trying things above 8q yet because yeah no they're, they're definitely difficult um, they're definitely difficult but yeah also don't feel dumb because there's like most people would struggle on them, definitely. I mean, I think the one Q cutters, not I think, the one Q cutters are literally PhD topics. If you, the so obviously they're a puzzle, so someone has solved them before, like it can only be a puzzle if it's been solved before, because then we know there's a solution. But um, if you were the first person to finish one of those one Q cutters, like the first person in history, you would probably be doing it in for like a PhD. So no, the, the Code Wars challenges are bloody difficult, but don't let it make you feel dumb. They are, they are hard. Well, sorry, I said bloody, although that doesn't count as a swear word anymore, hey? Um, okay, so um, what's cool about this, this topic here, data structures. So data structures, it starts on page 70 of your textbook if you wanna follow through there. What's the website? Because I wanna bookmark it. Uh, Cure, what, what do you mean what website? The website we made. The cutters. Oh, it's Code Wars, Taddy. Um, so all, all the challenges on Code Wars are called cutters. But I'll, we'll go through it at the end of the lecture in like the last five minutes, but I do want to get started on data structures. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so data structures, what's super cool about this topic is literally guys, by the time we finish data structures and the next lecture, which is on something called bubble sort, you will have finished first year computer science. Okay, so first year university computer science, by the time we finish this lecture and the next one, um, you'll have done it. Okay, which is like quite an impressive thing for, for your ages. So don't, don't underestimate what you're doing. Okay, but so with, without further ado, let's get started. So data structures, what are they? Data structures are ways a computer can store data. Okay, you might know what data is. We, we call data, it's like um, information is processed. Data, data is like just a bunch of facts and figures. Okay, data is just a bunch of facts and figures. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I suppose we can look at like a, a formal definition. But the important thing that you must know is that it's a, is that it's plural. Okay. Um, is that it's plural. So, well, we could, we could represent it that way. Definitely. We can represent data in binary. 100%. Um, binary itself is not, would not be, binary is just a counting system. Like, um, yeah, binary is just a counting system. We can represent data in binary, um, but it's not binary itself. Okay. Anyway, so um, yeah. But basically you can think of data as a group of facts and figures. Datum is the word where it's like, like one number, like one fact, one number, one figure, that would be called a datum, okay? That's the singular. But when we talk of data, we're talking about lots of data. Hundreds of numbers, thousands of numbers, millions of usernames, that's data, okay? So a data structure, as you might guess from the name, is a structure that stores or works with data, okay? So, but yeah, the important thing here is that they're plural. So you guys know about these, right? String, int, double, those are data types. We call them data types because different types, different forms of data can have these different types, right? But when we speak of data structures, we are speaking about many strings, many ints, many doubles, okay? Like many copies of these things. Right, so uh, there's lots of it. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. We're not talking about like one number, we're talking about lots of numbers. We're not talking about one string. We're talking about lots of strings. Okay. So there are four data structures relevant to this course. And broadly speaking, these are the four that you would cover at like in like most computer science courses. And just in general, these are the four important ones. Okay. You do know of one already. One code, one code was one cut. Um, one Q is the hardest. So each challenge ranges from eight Q to one Q, and each challenge is called a kata. It's sort of like how karate works, actually. Um, yeah, so each, each, yeah, so Q, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but one Q is the hardest, and it's bloody hard, like very, very, very difficult. Um, so yeah, anyway, okay, um, cool. So there are four different data structures. You guys already know of one, and I want you guys to tell me its name. What, how would I store multiple ints? How would I store multiple ints in C sharp in a way that you guys already know? What's it called? An array, precisely. That's, that's, the, first, that's the first data structure that's relevant to us. We've already learned a little bit about it. We're gonna cover it in more detail now. I imagine we'll cover arrays and then we'll come back to the rest in next week's lecture. The other three are queues, stacks, and linked lists, okay? We heard a little bit about stacks while we were discussing recursion, um, but we'll go through them in more detail now. You guys don't know about queues yet and you don't know about linked lists, okay? But after we've learned these four data structures, um, that will be this, this bit of the, the course done, okay? About, so what are we gonna learn about each of these data structures? We are gonna answer five questions, okay? How does the computer represent the data structure? How do we create the data structure? How do we access the items that are stored in the data structure? How do we manipulate the data structure? So how do we like add to it and remove from it and that kind of thing? And when do we use it? Okay, that's, that last one is a pretty important question, okay? Because 
yeah, we've got these four different data structures and you guys, you guys already know about an array, right? Like if you want to store multiple integers, an array makes sense. Why do you need anything else? Well, we'll see that there's advantages and disadvantages to each of these data structures and we'll go through, we'll go through what those are. All right. So that's, that's what this lecture is about. It'll be or lesson rather there are this, this will be split over probably this week's lecture and next week's. Um, but, but yeah, that's what we'll be learning. So, um, yeah, let's get started with arrays. We'll probably only, we'll probably finish this today and, and then come back to the other data structures next time. Are we ending at 4.30? We might go a little bit over time discussing code wars, but yeah, around 4.30, maybe 4.35. Okay, an array is a collection of items of the same type stored in contiguous memory. Okay, so there are two new words here. Homogenous means the same, okay? Everything's the same type. So if I have a, an array, it's either all ints or all strings or all chars, okay? Everything in the array, every type in the array is the same, okay? So an array can only hold one type. It's called homogenous. That means homogenous. Okay. It's stored in contiguous memory. Contiguous is another new word. What that means is that it's all next to each other. Everything's next to each other. Okay. So like actually literally in the computer's memory, it's all next to each other, right? If an array is 32 bits, I mean, if an integer is 32 bits um, and our array holds two integers, then there'll be an integer and right next to that integer in the computer's memory will be the next integer. So it'll be 64 bits in our computer's memory, integer next to integer. Okay, exactly like that. So yeah, it looks like this basically. In the computer's memory, everything's directly next to each other and we know that we index them, we start counting at zero, right? That's the special rule. We start counting at zero. We'll also learn why we do that um, in this. Like you'll understand why it is that we start coming at zero. Okay, so we just wanna answer those five questions about arrays and then um, that, will, that will do us for today. Okay, so first question, how do we create an array? You guys already kind of know this, but there, there is a different way that we all see now as well. Okay, so jumping over to Rex Tester, been a while since we've, we've seen this. Okay, and we are going to create this array. So I've got an array here that's holding five, six, three, four. Okay, an array holding five, six, three, four. So we are going to create that array. All right, so pretty simple. I think you guys know this by now. We'll make it an integer. How do I convert it into an array, guys? How do I tell C Sharp that this is an array of ints? What, 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 exactly, yeah. 100% we have to add those little square brackets after it. We give it a name. I'm going to call mine nums, right? Nums. Um, so it's just uh, like numbers. And we need to give it the list of numbers. So the array that we have in the slides is five, six, three, four. All right. Um, so oh, I think C sharp doesn't like it when semicolons come after. Okay, it doesn't mind. All right, good stuff. Cool, so that's how you create an array. At least that's the way we know so far. But there is another way. Okay, so I'm gonna show this second array here. We've got an array with just two items in it, dog and cat, okay, dog and cat. Now, what I, what I want you guys to get is that, yeah, there are multiple ways, there are these two different ways to create an array. We know of this way where you specify the entire list, but it is possible that you know um, what type the array is, and you know how many things you want it to hold. So let's say I want an array that can hold two strings, all right? But it's possible that you don't yet know what those strings are, right? It's possible that you don't yet know what the strings are. You just know that there's going to be two of them and that they're strings. Or for example, if you want a, an array that can hold five numbers, you're not, you don't yet know what the numbers will be, but you know that there are five of them and that they are ints. Okay. In that case, you can still create an array and it'll just have a set. It'll just be, um, it'll just be in like an empty array. Well, well, we'll, we'll see now. I'll, I'll show you guys now. 
Okay, so this other way of creating an array, an array is this top one in the slide here, um, but I'll just type it into, into Rex Tester so that you guys can see it. So let's say I want an array that can hold two strings, but I don't yet know what the strings are. How you would do that is you would say string as normal square brackets, okay? So that's saying that this is gonna be an array of strings. I'm gonna call it words, right? Words, makes sense as a name. And I'll say equals new string square brackets two, okay? So this number here, is telling it how many strings I want it to be able to hold. All right, it's telling it how many, and basically all it's all C Sharp is gonna do is gonna go, okay, I'm gonna allocate enough space in the computer's memory to hold two strings next to each other. But for now, I'm just gonna leave them empty. They are empty strings. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not too complicated of an idea. It's just like an empty array, basically. Um, an empty array that has enough space for what you want it to hold. Okay. But remember, it still needs a type and it's still contiguous. So homogeneous and contiguous. That's what makes something an array. Um, so I'll, we'll, we'll see now, Tubby. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see now. So you guys actually already know how to add strings to it. You know, you know how to. Um, because you know how to access it, but we'll, we'll see now, so, so don't worry too much. This, this is the next question, right? So we've answered the first question. How do we create it? Um, well, the first question was, what's the internal representation? We learn these words homogeneous and contiguous. We'll see some diagrams later that more specifically explain it. Um, but yeah, the next question is to say, so we know how to create it. The next question is, how do we access items in the array? So let's answer that first, and then we'll discuss this uh, concept of changing and manipulating items, okay? You already know how we access things, actually. So if I say console.write, everything still works normally, right? Wh whatever way we're creating the array, everything still works normally. So guys, um, in full, what would I have to type to access, oh yeah, um, so tuddy.write line will print out with a new line at the end, dot write will just not make a new line. Okay, it'll just print everything on one line. So it's basically the same, all right? Basically the same. Just a slightly, slightly different way of doing things. Okay. <laughs> I, I suppose just to avoid questions, let's stick to right line, okay? Um, but yeah, it's, it doesn't, doesn't matter too much. Okay, so um, nums. I, I'll show you. We will. I'll show you what it does. Just actually now, I'll, I'll show you what it does. Okay. So what the difference is? Okay, guys. But first, before we do that, can you answer the question? How do I access the number six in that array in nums? How do I access the number six? One. Right. But after the name of the array. Right. What is the name of the array? Like, give me an info. Yeah, so we'll say nums in position one. I think you guys do get it. So let's do that. Nums in position one. Okay, nums in position one. Okay. Cool. So when I run this, um, as we expect, it prints out six. All right. Let's try. So I'm going to access position. So you agree, this is an array that holds two things. Okay, it has size two. It can hold two items. It has space for two strings. So if I try to access words in position zero, you can see it just prints out nothing. Okay, it's just an empty string. It's basically this, you see? Like two quotation marks with nothing inside it, that's what it's storing. Okay, and if I access words in position one, um, you'll see that it's also just an empty string. But if I access words in position two, it will complain. It says, look, you're out of bounds, index out of bounds because it can only hold two strings. If I wanted to be able to access it in position two, I would have to be able to hold three strings, right? And then it's okay, then it's an empty string. Okay, um, to put it a different way, that's more explicit. I'm gonna make this an array of numbers. Okay, so I'll call this one X's and it's gonna be a new array that can hold two integers. Now, when I print out console.writeLine um, X's in position one, you'll see it prints out zero. 
So what this does, if I make this a new integer with 50, so this is an array that holds 50 integers. This is just gonna print out every single, so all, all 50 of the integers in that array, so you can see I can go to 49, are just zero. Okay, so it just made them zero. When it was a string, they made it, it made it an empty string like that. When it was an int, it just made it zero. Okay, so it's a fast way of creating an array. But um, let's talk about how to add, to add to an array now. So we know how to access it. You type the name of the array and the position that you're trying to access, right? The index. Well, it won't print out 50 zeros. It will still, because this, I was only printing out one index, right? I was accessing a specific zero. Um, but if you printed out the whole array, yeah, it would print out 50 zeros. We will see how to iterate over a whole array because it'll help you guys with the kata as well. Um, but for now, let's just, I, forgive me, but we must, we must get through it because I don't want to use too much of your extra time, okay? Um, cool. So the next question, we know how to access the array. You put the name and then in square brackets, the index you want to access. The next question is how do we manipulate the array? So how do I change the values? Okay, how do I change the values? So um, probably the best place to see this is in our words array, okay? So we've got this words array. It's just a array that holds two empty strings, okay? It holds two empty strings. We, we said here the number two, that means it's holding two empty strings, okay? So you can see when I access it words one, it's nothing. When I access word zero, it's nothing. By the way, you see it printing out nothing here. What that's printing out is this, okay? Just, just that, guys, like two quotation marks next to each other. It's an empty string, okay? So that's why it looks like nothing, okay? Um, so yeah, hopefully it makes sense to you. Um, but let's now set words in position zero. So all we do is say words in position zero equals and then whatever string we want it to equal, dog, for example. So I'm gonna make it dog. And when I run this, it prints out dog now. Words in position zero is now dog. So that's how we assign items to an array. We just use the equal sign as usual, right? This just takes the thing on the right and saves it in the thing on the left. Pretty simple. But when I print out words in position one, you see that that is still an empty string. Okay, it's still an empty string. But if I say words in position one equals cat, that will now print out cat. Okay. But remember, I am still limited by the size of the array. So if I wanted to say words in position two, words in position two equals bird, this is now not allowed. You'll see when I run this, it'll give me an error. And why does it give that error? because I do not have this space in memory. I defined an array that can hold two words. It can hold two strings, right? I said two here. If I want to be able to make words in position two, so this would be the third item in the array. If I want to be able to make that bird, I have to tell C sharp that this is an array that will hold three strings. Okay, and so now it's bird. All right. So we don't need to know every single item in the array in order to make an array of specific size. So where might this be useful? Let's say if you were on, menti on, on that little quiz site that we made where you guys type all of your nicknames, right? Someone made their nick nickname, uh, Creflo made theirs, I'll probably lose or something. Okay, if you make this your nickname, right? That's a string, it needs to be stored somewhere it would be stored in, a, in an array of nicknames, maybe. They could have stored it using one of the other data structures we'll learn later, but a good way to store it would be in an array of nicknames. The maximum, I, I know this, the maximum number of users we can have in a single quiz on Mentimeter is 200. So what you could do is say, all right, I don't know what the nicknames will be, but I know that they, I need an array of nicknames that will hold 200 strings, okay? And then you can just set, as a new user joins, you just set um, their nickname. Okay, so that's 
that would be one use case, right? You don't necessarily, oh, sorry, in order to set the nicknames, we had have to say nicknames in position zero, nicknames in position one, nicknames in position two, okay? Um, so you don't necessarily know all of the data that you need to store up front. You might just know how much you need to store, okay? You could, yeah, exactly. You could use read line to get the username from the, from the user and you can set it like that. So yeah, 100% Creflo, you could, you could use read, read line for that. Not gonna do that now, but you, you can do that, yeah. The point is to just illustrate that you don't need to know every single, um, you don't need to know every single data point. You don't have to give it a full list. You can just create an empty array, okay. So, so the computer save. Um, so yeah, if you create in this case, what the computer did here when on this line, where I say string nicknames equals new string 200, precisely what the computer did was it went to memory and it saved enough space in memory to hold 200 strings all next to each other. Yeah, quite impressive, right? And you can go quite, you can quite, go quite crazy with this. So if you need to store a thousand ID numbers, for example, you don't yet know what the ID numbers are, you could create an, an array of, you know, however long. Okay, so, so you don't use all that space, what happens to the remaining? No, so you are using all the space, remember Tadi, what it's done here is it actually created 200 empty strings. Okay. Ooh. Say you don't use all that. Say, say, say. Um, yeah, so what, what it did here is it actually created the empty string. So if I create an, uh, let me ask you this, Tadi, uh, this, this might make it make sense. Um, how large is an integer in C sharp? Do you remember that? How large is an integer in C sharp? Yeah, I, I so, um, yeah, what I want to show you is that, so yeah, can you answer that question though? How large is an integer in C sharp? Do you remember? Does anyone remember how large do you guys, do you guys remember? In bits. You, an integer, two bits, four, 32 bits. Yeah, an integer is 32 bits. Okay. Now, what you guys must remember is it doesn't, you remember that integers can hold numbers from, it's somewhere around minus 2.1 billion to plus 2.1 billion, right? Between minus 2.1 billion and plus 2.1 billion, an integer can hold numbers in that range, right? It doesn't matter what the integer is, okay? Like zero, the number zero in the computer, stored as an integer. When I say int x equals zero, this is using 32 bits of memory. That uses 32 bits of memory. If I say int x equals 200, it's still using 32 bits. If I say it's equal to 2,000, 20,000, 200,000, 2 million, um, 20 million, 200 million, 2 billion, this is always using 32 bits exactly, okay? It uses 32 bits to represent that integer. So when I create the array, to answer your questions, Hadi, when I create an array for 200 integers and it sets them all to zero, all the space is used. All the space is used. It used all, so 200 times by 32 would be uh, your uh, 6,400 bits. That 6,400 bits is all used. It's zeros. Zeros stored in 32 bits. Okay. So all the space is used. Yeah. Um, so instantly when you define it, the space is used. Okay. Cool. So um, we now know how to create an array. We know how to access an array. We know how to manipulate the array, right? So the name followed by square brackets and the index you're trying to access. Um, and if you just put an equal sign and the new value after that, then you'll, you'll be able to change it, okay? Doesn't matter what type the array is, it'll work for all of them. The next question to answer is when do we use them? Okay, 
So this we would have to discuss um, in a lot more detail. So I'm, we're going to come back to it next week because I don't want to use too much of your extra time. What I am going to do now is just remind you guys how to iterate over an, an array. Okay. So, and I'll also use this time to show you guys the difference between console.writeline and console.write. Okay. Because um, this will be a hint for the Code Wars cut I'm about to recommend to you guys. Okay. So I've got this array, okay, five, six, three, four, five. All right, it's called nums. I want to remind you guys that for each exists. Okay, so if I say for each int num in nums, and I say console dot right line num, okay, so num, I use num, so int num in nums, this will create an integer called num for each of the numbers inside our nums array, for each of the integers inside our number, nums array. And each one of them, when I run this, uh, oh, sorry, I needed to put a semicolon there. Um, when I run this, each one will be printed out. Okay, so that's how we iterate over an array. I wanna show you guys how to do one thing. It'll be, um, it might, it's a bit to help you, a little bit to help you. Okay. Um, so remember that if you have the array name, you'll always be able to do this. You just put the name of the array there. Okay. Um, I'm just going to, as an example, if I just call this R1, I could just say for in num in R1. So the, the name is now R1 and it'll do the same thing. Okay. So as long as you have the name of the array, you don't need to know what's in the array. Remember, this could be created somewhere else in some other method, okay? I'm just, I'm telling you all this, it might seem a bit weird, but I'm telling you all this just so that you can have some help on the Carter that I'm gonna recommend that you guys try out, okay? Now, Tuddy, just, and just everyone pay attention. If you ever see me using console.write instead of write line, it's a very simple difference. So when I say console.write line like this, and I run that, you see it prints everything on a new line, if I just say console.write, it will just print everything next to each other. Okay, so that's the only difference. Yeah, uh, it's like, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just shorter to type, um, but it's not much of a difference. So write line will just create a new line after it prints the thing out. Okay, so first thing I wanna show you guys here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Cool. So hypothetically, guys, if I wanted to add all of the numbers in this array up, okay, so I could create this other integer called sum. All right. So this is the sum of all the numbers in the array. And I can say four int num in R1 or four int x in R1. You could call that number whatever you want. And you can say sum equals sum plus x. Okay. And that would sum up the array. So the sum of five plus six plus three plus four plus five is 23. Okay. And if I wanted to add another array to that, maybe I could create another for each loop. Okay. The reason I told you that is because it will, it's a little hint for the Carter that I'm going to recommend. If you guys are struggling with the Carter, rewatch this end of the lecture and hopefully it'll make more sense. Okay. But anyway, so now let's talk about Code Wars. Cool. I hope you guys managed to solve the initiation challenge. If you didn't, um, please WhatsApp me and I'll give you some assistance. Okay. Solve the initiation challenge. Sign up for an account. You don't understand the loop. Um, the for each loop, you mean this one. So all this is doing, so we've got this array of ints R1. Okay, you understand that we created an array of integers called R1. We say for each, you can read it as English actually, for each integer called X in R1. So all it's saying, all it's saying is for each of the numbers in R1, create an integer called X. Okay, I'll, I'll explain it like this. Let me make it full screen and just... Please send again in the group. For Code Wars, you mean, Ada? I, I will, I'll post about Code Wars again in the group as well. And I'll post another hint for the, for the initiation challenge as well. 
Um, okay, so what, what is the loop doing? So did you, actually, let me ask you this. Did you understand it when it was like this? Console.writes x. So not, not summing anymore. It's not summing anymore. Did you understand it when it was like this, Creflo? You did. Oh, okay, cool. Then, then you're, okay, good. I was, I was wondering, so you just weren't understanding the sum. That's okay. So you see what this is doing. The variable X, on the first time the loop runs, it holds a five. The second time it holds a six. The third time it holds the three. Then it holds the four. Then it holds the five. Right, so you can see it prints out five, six, three, four, five. Right, you see it go through the loop like that. Okay, if I wanted to add, so I want to like add these together. So I want to say five plus six plus three plus four plus five and get that number into an integer. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll create an integer, another integer. So obviously, if I add five to six to three, all of those are integers. So when I add them all together, they'll still be an integer, right? So I'm going to create an integer called sum, okay? And it's initially going to be zero. Okay? It's initially zero. Okay? Inside the loop, instead of just printing out x, so I'll still, I'll leave it. So it's still printing out x, okay? I'm now going to say that sum so sum is initially zero, right? Equals sum plus x. So you see it prints out x. So on the first time it runs, it'll be five. So what will this do? It'll say sum, which is currently zero on the first run, equals zero plus five. That's five, right? And then it'll go again. X will then be six. So then it'll print out six and it's gonna say sum equals sum, which is five now, remember, plus six, which is 11. So then sum's 11. It'll go back to the top. X will then be three, the third. Okay, cool, fantastic. If you get it, that's good. If anyone is still a bit worried about this, um, then feel free to, you know, ask. And, and we can go through it again. But, but I think if you, if you rewatch just this portion of the lecture, you should be able to get the cutter, okay? Now, remember, this is just going over R1. If you wanted to go over a second array, you would have to create another for each loop and do the sum again. Okay, um, but, but don't worry, you guys will, I think you guys will figure it out. Um, so I'm gonna stop printing out console.write and now I'm just gonna print out the sum and you see it just goes through, it adds each of the numbers together and we get 23, right? Which is five plus six plus three plus four plus five. Okay, now, cool. So Code Wars, if when you log in, you'll get something like this. This is what the homepage of Code Wars looks like. There's a few things we have to talk about. On Code Wars, you can create a clan, okay? If you mouse over, you're in the top right and go to account settings. You see my clan is called Brighter Futures, okay? If you type Brighter Futures exactly like that, capital B, capital F with a space between and an S at the end into your clan here, on, on your account settings. Your one will be empty initially. If you type Brighter Futures there, you will automatically join my clan, okay? I don't have to send you an invite or anything. That's how you join a clan. You just type Brighter Futures there and then we'll be in the same clan. What that'll do is it'll add you onto my like followers list. Um, so if I go to social, I think it is, um, I'll be able to see your guys' account here and we'll be able to work through the cutters together if we solve the same cutter, we'd be able to compare solutions and things like that. So please do join my clan. Okay, so type Brighter Futures, visit your account settings, type Brighter Futures under your clan name. Okay, next thing. If you go to the left here and you click on cutter, okay, so you mouse over this weird arrows pointing at each other and you click on cutter, you'll get a list of all of the cutters on Code Wars. Okay. You can search this list. You can click by difficulty. So there's 8Q to 1Q. 8Q is the easiest. So if you click on 8Q, it's gonna only show you 8Q ones. Okay, and for now, that's all we wanna see, all right? Now, um, you can filter by language as well. So click my languages and just click C sharp because we are only interested in cutters that can be done in C sharp, okay? 
and then you can type the name of the kata. Each kata has a name. The kata that we are doing today or that I am recommending you do today is called array plus array. Array plus array. Okay. I'm going to open up this kata now. And all this does, so I'm going to switch over to a different language just in case it shows you my previous solution. Okay. But obviously you'll do it in C sharp. So you'll click C sharp and click train. I think if I click train again, it shouldn't show you my previous solution. Oh, uh, um, okay. You don't do it this way. Do it with four loops. Okay. Do the four each loops. Okay. I, that's really unfortunate that it showed my previous thing. Um, but I'll check because this way, this way is weird. Okay. Anyway, so what does this do? When you say for each, okay. Okay. No, it's good. I mean, technically the recording will be available, but don't, don't, don't view it because, okay. So what I'm just going to show you is what, what this is doing. You are given two arrays. Okay. They are called array one and array two, R1, R2. But Tadi, I will show you my solution next week and we'll go through them together. Um, but yeah, do solve it yourself first, okay? Um, so, and solve it with four each loops because the solution I had here was just a gross one, okay? Um, that requires you to do this, okay? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, so yeah, it won't even work for you initially if you, if you tried to use my one. Um, so that's, that's the funny thing. Um, okay. So yeah, just use the, use the for each loop that we, we, we just discussed. You've got two arrays here. They are called R1 and R2. What they want you to do, they want you to create an integer called int answer or something like that. It'll initially be zero. And how we showed you would create a for each loop. I'll, I'll just write it out. So for each loop for R1 and a for each loop for R2. And remember, you'll add, you'll add up all of the numbers in R1 to answer. You'll add all of the numbers in R2 to answer. And then you will type return answer. Okay, return answer. Okay. When you are happy with your solution, when you want to test it out and feel free to test as much as you want, you can go to the bottom right and click test. Okay, click test. Okay, you can see this way didn't work because I didn't actually program the for each loops, but you can see it fa says test failed, it expected a 21 and it got a zero. Obviously I set answer to zero initially. So when I return answer, it's always zero. Um, so it received zero, but it expected 21. So it'll tell you how you were wrong. Okay. And yeah, that's all I'm going to tell you about the cutter. Oh, and when you're done. So after you, if you click test and it says you passed everything, then you'll just click attempt and then click submit. Okay. Yeah. You're just adding up the two arrays all into one. There are two arrays. There's R1 and R2. If you want to see the instructions again, you can click on instructions and it says I'm new to coding and now I want to get the sum of two arrays, actually the sum of all their elements. I'll appreciate your help. Each array includes only integer numbers. The output is also a number. So that's the instruction. Um, you can check your output. I, if once you've solved it, you can check all of the solutions. Obviously I won't click past solutions cause it'll spoil it. And yeah, once you're done, you can click attempt and um, it will go ahead and run it and then you'll have to click submit to submit your final solution okay yeah well if if you fail you can just attempt again so you see i clicked attempt and this obviously failed and it does multiple tests and you could just click attempt again but testing just happens more quickly okay so just click test when you're testing your your answer okay and you can also see what tests it's running so these are the tests that it will run um, but don't, don't even try to understand this yet. Maybe we'll discuss it more next week. For now, just solve the cutter in the top where it says solution here. Okay, over here. Okay. Cool. And yeah, and if once you join my clan, I'll also be able to see your solutions. We'll be able to go through them and just like, you know, work through things together. And each week I'll look, I'll look for a different cutter. Okay. I can, can check now. So... Yeah, I still only have five followers, but 
once, oh no, I've got more now. Okay, T, yeah, Tari, there you are. Cool. I, I see you here. And uh, yeah, I can go and you see, like I can click, assuming we've both solved the kata, I'll be able to see um, how you did it. So yeah, you completed multiply, I see. Okay, um, cool. So yeah, are you in the clan orc side? So I'll check that now. So I go to social and click on social and yeah, you're there, I see you and I can see the number of points and stuff you have as well. So yeah, that's cool. So yeah, once you solve this array plus array kata, you'll have six. Okay, it's gonna add four points. Um, and you can see that you, you'll level up as well. Uh, yeah, no, I saw the question, you are there. He is there, yeah, I can see. Yeah, so once you solve the kata, your points will go up, okay. And yeah, we'll have like a little competition going, okay. Oh, no, the previous one. Oh. Right. Uh, yeah, so that's correct, Creflo. You don't know, it can be any array. It must work for any two arrays. But remember, you do know the name of the array. Okay. The first array they give you is R1. And you know, from the name, you know how to create a for each loop, right? And the second array they give you is R2. So you'll create two for each loops exactly like we did. You'll add up the answers and, and you'll get a solution. Okay. Um, you should, I've given a lot of hints now. It should be pretty okay. But again, you might have to think a little bit. Again, it is a puzzle, right? So it should be difficult, <laughs> at least a little bit. You don't know the numbers. You know that there are arrays. They're just giving you a method. So I, I can show you again if, if you want. So array plus array. Um, you don't know the numbers. It can, must work for any array of integers, any two array of integers, however long it must work. Okay. I'll open mine again. It's gonna show, okay, it doesn't, it's cool. So yeah, um, it, they give you the arrays over here. So you see it says int with the square brackets R1, int with the square brackets R2. Okay, so the arrays are there, the arrays are there. Um, and you can see they are technically defined down here, the tests, but I must work for any numbers. Yeah, any, 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 any. So any array one of integers and any array two, it must work. But you know how to create a for each loop from the name of the array. So you don't even have to think about that. It's quite simple. Um, like once you, because remember, it doesn't matter what the array contains, right? Like. Look, I'll, I'll show you like this. Basically, I've got this int r1, okay? <laughs> um, it might be a little confusing now, but you'll, it'll make sense to you. Look, so this is gonna be an array. So int r1 is a new int with 200 numbers in it, okay, 200. They're all zeros now, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? If I wanna sum, if I wanna work with all 200 of those, Right, I can just say int sum equals zero. This for each loop will work, right? It doesn't matter how long it is. So if I just run this, it's gonna sum up all 200 of those integers and the sum is zero because they're all zero currently, okay? If I made it a thousand, right? It's gonna sum up all a thousand zeros. I didn't have to change anything. So you just need to focus on how to create this for each loop for R1. If I wanted it to work on R2, I would just make the name R2, right? And have to give it the R2 array, obviously. Okay. So you don't, don't overthink it is what I'm telling you. They have given you the arrays. They are R1 and R2. You know how to create a for each loop. You've got the name of the two arrays that you're working with. You know how to create a for each loop for each of those arrays. So the only thing you have to think about is how do you add each of the numbers in R1 and R2 using these two for each loops, how do you add them to answer? Okay, how do you add them to answer? That's what you have to think about. Okay, I have used up 10 minutes of your, of extra time. So I'll, I'll, we, we can stop now. Okay, <laughs> um, cool, so I'll stop sharing. But yeah, thank you guys for coming. Good luck on the Carter. Feel free to ask me if you need more tips, but I think, 
if you watch the if you watch the end of this lecture again where we're going through it um, going through it in Rex tester that should that's a big hint but also just think about how to create that for each loop okay the for each loop will go over r1 for you it'll go over r2 for you it doesn't matter what's in the array doesn't matter what's in the array okay i uh, uh, fire away Creflo. Tuddy, is your brain still throbbing as well, or, or it's making more sense now? Um, but yeah, you guys can you guys can go now. You can attempt the kata, and yeah, good luck, and see you next week if you are going. Kinda, but I'll get it. Cool. Yeah, no, good luck, and I mean, yeah, just it'll take work, right? It's your first, it's your first kata. Since we are doing year one of C sharp and uni. If so, we decide to continue to learn C sharp. Are we going to have to learn? Um, so you won't cover C sharp in at university, Creflo. They'll never cover any specific language. You'll learn basically exclusively theory and like more and different languages. You'll probably do C and Python at university. Um, but you'll see that once you've learned it in C sharp, you you you'll know it and everything. But also, it's very cool to go into uni already knowing things. Because you, remember, you'll take four course if you go to VITS at least. It depends what university you plan to go to. But if you go to a university, you'll probably take four first year courses. It's so like maybe maths, computer science, physics, game design, I don't know, whatever. You'll take four courses in first year. So it's really nice if you already know first year computer science, then you can just concentrate on um, the other stuff and use your free time to party and play games and stuff. So, yeah, no, it's, it's nice being like covering things again. You don't want to, um, like if everything's new, it'll be too crazy. Like I did AP maths at school. And so first year maths was, was nice because I had seen it all before. Um, yeah, so it's, it's nice to, to have the extra free time because the other courses are hard. Like first year can be pretty brutal. Yeah. And there will still be new stuff. You haven't technically, like it's not all of first year comms um, that we've covered. There will still be occasionally some new stuff, but yeah. And yeah, fire away with your next question. I must log on to WhatsApp quick because people are posting questions. What good what good is this MS certificate for? Or what good is this MS certificate for? Um, I think having an MTA, especially if you want to become a, a developer at Microsoft, then it's very useful to get this out of the way uh, because then you can you can immediately go on to do your MCSA and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, cheers, John. By the way, guys, unless you're if you're interested in hearing questions or asking your own questions, then you're welcome to stay. Um, but you feel free to go as well. Um, so yeah, goodbye, Jean Marc. Um, Cool. So yeah, if you're looking to continue with your MCSA and other Microsoft certificates, then that's very good for you. Otherwise, it's similar to AP Maths, right? Like all of these extra courses, maybe add a little bit, make your university application a little bit easier. They'll um, make university itself a little bit easier. So yeah, but I'm only sitting on five points. Oh, maybe they did a different, uh, let me see. Uh, so code work. Well, so to read, wait, you already finished the kata. What's your, uh, so you T Mac D. Let me click. So you are kata. Oh yeah, you did the array plus array kata. That's cool. Nice, nicely done. Um, what does this mean? Source solution error. I, your guys calling me off. Um, I need identify expected source solution error, identifier expected. Um, hmm. It's difficult to tell, Tadi, but look on line, is that line eight? L line eight, character 11, and just look if there's, there's a problem there. Okay, yeah, line sevens and eight. Look, look on those lines and just check if there's a problem. But you can also like backspace them and retype re them. Just make sure that the for each is, is formatted correctly, like perfectly, okay? 
like not a single character must be out because something might look meaningless to you now like on the for each loop but just make sure that it's uh yeah bryn i sorry i was logging into whatsapp now to to answer your question because i did see it um it's just that i put off whatsapp when but i don't know what's wrong okay let me look now ah okay so uh that's interesting so you're trying let me let me ask you this bryn what you can you can type it here. Uh, see you, Creflo. Uh, cheers, Tariq. Oh, sorry, you were asking Tariq. Are you still there? Or no, you're not. Okay, uh, it's all good. Um, so, um, Bryn, what operator do you, can we use to multiply numbers together? So, if I write like two times two in maths, how would you do that in C sharp? What what operator would you replace that x with? Exactly. So the name of the method is multiply. They give you an integer A and another integer B. Okay. And basically, they want you to return the, um, the product of A and B. Okay. So does that help? Because I see you've put like brackets around it and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think you were maybe overcomplicating it a little bit. So they just want you to multiply them. Yeah, yeah. So now I imagine you see it and it'll be fine, okay? Um, so yeah, you just need to make one that one change and then, and then you'll be able to go on to the color. Okay, cool. So are there any other questions? If not, I do need to stop because there's this person who's calling me quite a lot. Um, a parent from another school. Um, so any other questions, guys, or are we doing good? Tadi, did you manage to fix this error or still? Okay, cool. Uh, awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah, cheers, Ada. Cheers. Thank you for coming, guys. Attendance was good today. And um, yeah, see you. See you all next week. Hope you, hope you do well on the cutter and have a good week as well. Okay, cool. No props. Cheers.